right, well, good evening. So we um, uh, didn't exactly practice this, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, tag team back and forth a little bit in terms of our uh, presentation and uh, try to give you some good information from two different perspectives. We've got the sort of the uh, diagnosis and surgery perspective on my side, and then we have uh, conservative management and therapy perspective. And uh, I think this will be a nice balanced approach. We'll try to show you a little bit of anatomy. We'll try to show you some uh, splints and some different techniques and hopefully give you information. Uh, we don't want to get too detailed. On the other hand, we want to make sure that you leave tonight thinking that you learned something and, and uh, benefited. Um, and then, of course, uh, we'll keep this fairly informal. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand, uh, and we will uh, try to answer your questions. Um, and with that, we're going to start. We have a you know pretty comprehensive uh, schedule. We'll have to kind of watch our time to make sure we don't go overboard. Um, but we'll try to cover these topics. So carpal tunnel, which is numbness in the hand, cubital tunnel, which is at the elbow, which can cause numbness in the hand as well. And then uh, some other problems, trigger finger, that's, I'm sure you've heard of that. We've got uh, a couple of overuse problems, like the uh, day programs, tenosynovitis, and tennis elbow, um, and then some other sort of unique problems, like the, uh, the contractures. So uh, we'll try to cover these, these items. So I think we'll let you start first. Let's see how this works. We'll try to switch to your slideshow. And then when you're ready for me to take over, just let me know. So, I think we're going to cover that, so I'm going to go to what I do next. When I do an assessment, I look at the whole patient. I don't just look at what they're complaining about. I look at everything, both sides, any of the detailed history, how you got hurt, how long you've been hurt, if it's a second, third, fourth episode, if you've had treatment before. And then I put up some of the instruments that I'll use to soften scar tissue. These are Grafton instruments. These are stainless steel. They're just a little foreboding, but they work. <laughs> really, that looks a little terrifying. They work really well to uh, soften scar tissue, fascia, and get someone if they're coming and start gliding easier. This is a dynamometer. I use that to uh, measure grip. These are Sun's Weinstein monofilaments, so I use that to check sensation. They're graded with uh, pressure, and they're different widths, and it's very light touch. I use that as part of my assessment. So when I look at someone looking at strength, if something's blocked, if it's not moving well, if they're weak, if they have uh, flattening of hands and atrophy, if they're substituting, or if all the provocative tests for each different thing come up positive, then it's a red flag. Okay, so we will talk a little bit about lateral epicondylitis. No, we will get this. We will get this. <laughs> Lisa, while he's doing that, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell people your background and what you do and things? Or did I miss that? Uh, no, um, I'm a certified hand therapist and an occupational therapist. I've been a therapist for like 30 years, 30 <laughs> plus years. Um, my passion is actually hand trauma, and I love to make splints, so I brought several, some that correlate with the diagnoses that we have, and some that are more traumatic. So if people want to come up and look, or as we talk, or Dr. Burchard talks, I'll like, pick one up and show you what I would splint with. So if anybody has any questions, please ask. We're going to go just a little bit out of order because Elise has prepared a couple of nice sections to her talk that we're going to kind of let her focus on, and then we'll kind of jump back to my, uh, some of the pictures I put in. It, I was just going to say, some people got the flyer, but you might want to introduce yourself. Okay, so Keith Burchard, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at Washington Orthopedic Center. I've been here, I think I'm coming up on 10 years now. I'm actually from uh, Chehalis. Uh, I grew up in uh, Chehalis and graduated uh, from WF West and then went off to Seattle uh, for uh, undergraduate uh, school and, and uh, University of Washington for medical school, and then to Ohio for my orthopedic training. And so I do general orthopedics, but sort of a special focus on 
uh, hand surgery and upper extremity. Um, uh, so I do a lot of a lot of these surgeries that we're going to talk about today. And so, and, and I have uh, three partners here at the practice, and, and we basically we all do um, uh, hand surgery and, and a lot of these procedures. And we would love to see you anytime. So. Um, not that this is a big advertisement, but it sort of is a big advertisement. You understand this is a big advertisement. We'd be happy to see you anytime and make an appointment. Uh, and, and if it's a problem that we can't solve, we will certainly try to point you in the right direction. So, uh, so let's just a brief my brief overview of, of the epicondylitis problems, and then we'll at least kind of go into a little more detail. So, people may have heard of tennis elbow or golfer's elbow. Have you, have you heard of that? So, mm -hmm. so tennis elbow. Uh, for me, when I describe tennis elbow, it's pain at the lateral aspect of the elbow, right here at this sort of knobby uh, piece of bone right here. And that's where some of the muscles attach. And uh, tennis elbow, it's the backstroke. So when you do your backstroke, not that I know how to do tennis very well, but the backstroke, you've really got to stabilize the wrist. And you're using the muscles that, that extend the wrist, and that's where you are stressing that attachment, where those muscles attach to the bone. And then in golf, and I'm even probably worse at golf, uh, but the, in, in golf, you're using some flexor muscles that attach to the medial side of the elbow to hold your club. And so golfers can get the similar problem at the medial aspect of the elbow. And it's an overuse problem. It's a repetitive micro trauma where the muscles will tear, and then they'll try to heal, and they'll tear because you keep doing it, and you develop this very painful uh, uh, attachment for the muscles. And, and it can be a tough problem. It can take up to a year to get through this, even with all the treatments that we'll, we'll talk about. I'll just try to show you a couple of pictures. This, uh, this shows the, um, the tennis elbow, uh, sort of an artist's conception of what that repetitive microtrauma and the, and the partial tearing of the, uh, of the muscle tendon where it attaches to the bone. And again, this, this shows you the, the medial and the lateral. So the lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow and, and then golfer's elbow. So, if, well, here I go now. Right. I will come over here and let you speak to Okay, so the tendonitis is when it is inflamed. We already showed you the anatomy. The tendinosis is more a degeneration, sometimes a tearing. And usually, um, what I do is I'll put people in a resting splint. It's somewhat controversial. I don't know how you feel about the bands anymore. I'm willing to try them. It's, okay. it's a good intervention to try. Okay. And so, I don't need to show you my anatomy here again. It's usually right here, and the pain can be absolutely brutal. And sometimes I'll see people with both lateral and medial, and they kind of come in and go, <laughs> do something. <laughs> so, a lot of people do repetitious stuff, I'll see. Um, racquetball players, I'll see a lot. Not so much tennis, but people who do heavy um, manual labor. And then we do uh, several different provocative tests, like um, wrist extension and turning. And usually, if they can't tolerate it, they'll withdraw. And usually, it's the shorter extensor on the lateral side that bothers people most. And usually, when I get into the muscle belly, they didn't realize how much that hurt. So the first thing that I already mentioned was that we need to rest it. And sometimes people, if they come in late, obviously it's more of a problem. Sometimes they think it will go away and they'll wait to in six months. And it's starting season. It will be interesting because they get so swollen up sometimes I can do it clear across the room. And so when we start therapy, we mobilize them. And then when they're <coughs> about two or less, We'll start to do um, active pain-free motion. Um, this is one of the types of splints. You can use a prefab splint. This rests those extensors pretty nicely. And sometimes people will use a band. Sometimes some of the physicians up there have done dry needling or injections. So it depends on really what your preference is. I actually really like the grafting in strands. And sometimes, are any of you familiar with kinesio taping? Besides mm -hmm. the therapist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You are. I sometimes will double tape and pull up that extensor mass and tape it so that 
it's kind of acting like the dam so that it doesn't allow the tent and the full excursion, the horrible ripping pain at the end. So then when we start strengthening you, it's always pain-free, go into range, then different types of strengthening and endurance. But we don't want to just strengthen this part. We want to strengthen the whole upper quarter. And also things to think about are positioning at work. Some people are coming in demonstrating typing like this when they would be much better like this. Or they have two screens and they keep doing this and flipping through charts. So we'll give them some ergonomic suggestions. Then medial group, I see that much less. Usually that is sports people. And resisted flexion is usually really painful for them with their palm up. So just a couple more things kind of from my perspective. There, yes, there is surgery for lateral and medial epicondylitis, but that's, in my perspective, sort of the end of the road. So we really want to try some good conservative measures. This is a common problem, and most of the time we can resolve this without having to resort to surgery. And in fact, I've had it before, and I've had it flare up before. I kind of know what it feels like. And so to me, we will start with the simplest and sort of least expensive thing. We're going to try anti-inflammatories. And we're going to try to change your activities to avoid aggravating this. And the simplest thing for lateral epicondylitis is changing how you approach things with your hand. We're so used to reaching this way to lift something up or to turn a doorknob or to pick up a grocery bag. And to do this so your wrist doesn't go like that, you use those sore muscles. And this will hurt every time you pick something up. But if you, for lateral epicondylitis, if you can approach it palm up, now you're resting those muscles. So that's a very simple intervention, but you have to train yourself. Mm -hmm. We're so used to doing everything like this, you have to approach it palm up. And uh, for example, I had a fellow that ran a tractor for a living, and his tractor levers were over here, and we could not get through this until he, he rebuilt his tractor lever so he could grab it like this. And all of a sudden, now he got through this <coughs> painful episode. So now when that doesn't work, when it may not, then we'd certainly go to physical therapy. Uh, we do, sorry, occupational therapy. We go to therapy. And, um, and again, there is a distinction. Maybe you could clarify the therapy distinction, how you see it. And OK. So a certified hand therapist can be an OT or a PT, but I do a lot of splints to look at the functional stuff, which PTs do as well. But so, so a, a hand therapist usually is going to be an occupational therapist. Can be either. Either, but specializes in hand therapy, and um, and then they're also physical therapists, and, and and a lot of physical therapists will also cover some of these things that we're talking about. But when it gets to the very specialized say, tendon rehabilitation, you really need to get especially into a hand therapist because that's where you really uh, shine with your with your braces and everything else. If you live way out in um, uh, Morton, for example, I'm not sure they have a special hand therapist, but I, I know that their therapists take care of some hand problems. So, um, but uh, again, the hand therapy is, is, I guess when I say therapy, I mean hand therapy. So, uh, so we'll, go to, we'll go to hand therapy. We can also try some injections, and we'll do a steroid injection. There's the possibility of what's called dry needling, where instead of, of injecting a medicine, you just use a needle, needle to, to basically aggravate the muscle to try to promote healing, try to bring in some new uh, blood flow and some and some uh, healing. So there are certainly a variety of uh, braces as well that, that uh, Lisa already talked about. So when all those things fail, which they do occasionally, there is, uh, there is surgery, I won't go into a lot of detail, but we can make an incision and actually go in and take out the damaged tendon and repair it. Um, and, then, and then after that, therapy is really a crucial part of the recovery process. Uh, and it's about a three-month recovery process after that surgery. So let's let's move on to carpal tunnel. I uh, just have a couple of pictures, and then I'll have Lisa discuss it. And if I find where I left it, so no, there we go. Right, we'll just go through a couple of these here. Carpal tunnel, also called median neuropathy, because it's the median nerve that's being compressed. This is a very common problem where the, uh, where the median nerve is coming down through the wrist and it passes under what's called the transverse carpal ligament, which is uh, labeled here, the, the white band kind of going across. So underneath that same ligament are all the tendons that run your fingers. So the muscles are in your forearm, the tendons then pass under that ligament, ligament and out to the, to the fingers. 
and over time you can get some buildup of what's called the synovium or the padding around the tendons and, uh, and then develop uh, compression of the, of, the, um, uh, of the nerve. So if you think about a tendon, a tendon is a very soft and floppy structure until you put it under tension and then it's rock hard like a cable. And so, of course, when we're doing things with our hands, that's exactly what we're doing. Is we're putting those tendons under tension. So they're very firm, tight structures. And then you've got that soft nerve in there. And so as you grip and twist, for example, those tendons will sometimes move and catch that nerve and, and really uh, uh, tweak it. And in the, the area that that, uh, that nerve covers would be these three fingers and this half of the ring finger. So that's the sort of this group of fingers for the median nerve <coughs> that we're talking about. Um, if it's severe, you can actually lose the muscle mass in your hands. So these are called the thenar muscles, or the base of the thumb muscles here. And, and that is supplied by that nerve after it passes through the carpal canal. And so if you've got bad carpal tunnel, we don't want to see this. We want you to come in well before this so we can help you out. This can be permanent. If you lose those muscles, that muscle mass, that's really, uh, that can be permanent. Um, and again, we'll just briefly mention that if we get to the surgery, essentially we're trying to release that tight, that tight band, the, the transverse carpal ligament. Um, and again, just uh, it, can, it can be done open with an incision, uh, as labeled here, just an incision in the, in the palm. Or there's also, we can do it with what's called an endoscope, which is a little camera and a screen. And we work through a little bit smaller incision to kind of work inside. Um, and let's see if we can flip over to your talk. One and tell us some more details. So he hits all of the anatomy. So a patient is there complaining of dropping things, waking up at night, buzzing that they can't get rid of. So then um, we'll do an evaluation frequently. I'll put somebody in something like this or a prefab Velcro splint. We don't want them pushed way back because that pushes increased pressure onto that median nerve. And so we want to try to keep them in neutral, and I'll teach them uh, tendon gliding, median nerve glides, which kind of glide it a little bit. And if they end up in surgery, then we'll do um, wound care, scar desensitization. I have a variety of things in the clinic, something called uh, fluidotherapy, which is ground up corn husk. It kind of bombards the area. Because what you want to do is overload the scar so it learns to accommodate to that and we gradually gain range and strength and function because you can go back to work and of course we always look at their ergonomic situation. So essentially to wrap it up, so carpal tunnel uh, syndrome is primarily numbness and tingling in, in, in these fingers, typically works with gripping and twisting. Uh, people in the, in the past has been commonly associated with certain work activities. And I'll tell you, um, the, um, lots of people have carpal tunnel, lots of people who work can get to carpal tunnel, lots of people who maybe don't work at a specific job can get to carpal tunnel. And uh, from the perspective of the state l &I department, they would rather not cover carpal tunnel. It's expensive for the state. And so it's getting more and more tricky to, uh, to, to be able to get this covered through the, through the state. Um, Either which way, I mean, if you have it, you have it, and, and we would want to do a you know, clinical assessment. There's a test called the nerve conduction test, where you actually measure the speed of the, of the nerve as it sends a signal, and then we can determine how, how bad is the carpal tunnel, and is this, some, is this something that's going to need uh, you know, aggressive treatment or not. And we have the therapy options, we have the options of activity modification, sometimes a steroid injection, and uh, there's certainly an option of uh, surgery, and, and we kind of briefly mentioned a couple different ways we can do the surgery. Most people do quite well with the surgery and um, are back to all of their normal activities in, a, in an average of about five weeks, and that, that's, a, that's an average. So it means if you go back to maybe an office job or a light position, you might be back within even a couple of days or a week or two, versus maybe a heavy construction job, you really could be out of work for a couple of months, recovering and really getting your strength back again. This is where the therapy can certainly be uh, critical. Any questions about this sort of brief overview of carpal tunnel? Okay, well let's, uh, do you want to cover some day veins and then, um, sure. uh, do you want me to show some sure. anatomy pictures real quick yeah. first? Okay, I'll see if I can find, what's that word, day
that go there? Yeah, go there. And actually, I'll name you if you see those two things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But just briefly, Dave, Dave Corbain um, is named after, I suppose, mm -hmm. Dr. Dave Corbain. I, you know, I, I guess I could look that up. Uh, sounds kind of French to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's an overuse uh, of a couple of the tendons here in the, in the back of the wrist. There are actually six channels here in the back of the wrist for our extensor tendons that, that extend the fingers or straighten the fingers. And there are two that control the thumb that particularly uh, cause a lot of grief. And I think the reason that is is the thumb or the wrist has to do a lot and this side of the hand does a lot whether you're bending the wrist up and down this way or back and forth and to make this corner you have to have a channel to guide that tendon along so it'll make that corner otherwise it would just bowstring straight across and that wouldn't uh, be very useful for us and so there's kind of a tight spot right there and two tendons in a tight spot are very easily irritated and um, it's typically this kind of a motion so I tend to get it, here I go again, when I'm hammering a lot. If I'm going to do a project at home, I'm building a fence, and I'm, you know, maybe I've had better hammering technique, but I, that's what tends to set it off for me. Uh, I have people talk about lifting a lot of boxes in, in this kind of a, a position, or a mom lifting up a child um, you know, under the arms, and it's a lot of this well, activity can really set that off. And it can be quite painful to the point where you can't do that. You can't lift up your little baby because your wrist hurts so much. Um, here is a picture of, uh, of that series of tendons and looking at just sort of those first two tendons that go to the thumb. And again, they pass under a band here, similar to the other side, this transverse carpal ligament for carpal tunnel. This is the extensor retinaculum. It runs all the way across the back of the wrist and sort of guides the tendons along. Uh, just a little more of an up-close view of the, uh, of the two tendons in question. Um, so uh, if you want to... I don't really think I need that. I think okay. it's actually the same. Um, so I see a lot of new moms that have it, or people that are doing repetitious work. I see beauticians that have it, people that are sometimes doing landscaping. And so what we do is we rest them, we'll cut them, make a splint, which is called a thumb spica, that'll rest those tendons, and I'll put them in a little bit of extension so they can't because sometimes it's so swollen and so irritated, they can't move. So we'll do that. We, sometimes I'll use a grass in, I'll use ultrasound. Sometimes I'll do a little bit of joint distraction, mobilization. And a lot of times I'll do kinesio taping underneath on the splint just so they can rest. Because sometimes people can use this tape and you can use the tape either to support or inhibit or facilitate something. So I'll use it, and sometimes they can take this off and be a lot more functional with it and they're pretty happy, especially the new moms, because those are a little bit hard for new babies. Mm -hmm. So then we progress them through modalities, isometrics, then strengthening back to activity. So again, so they provide that get an overuse condition. Um, so most of the time we'll start with sort of basic, again, the anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, activity modification, bracing, therapy, sometimes we'll do an injection, a steroid injection, to try to settle those uh, tendons down. And then we get to surgery, and certainly surgery is, a, is an option, it's a small incision, and we basically release that extensor uh, retinac and the little band, and, and we give those uh, tendons a, a little extra space. And that, uh, again, with an appropriate period of recovery, typically will, will resolve the problem. How does it present? I mean, what are the symptoms of this particular thing? pain? Right, right over the the uh, wrist on this side of the wrist, kind of right at the base of the thumb, especially bad. What the picture is showing here is a test we do where you grab your thumb like this and then bend it down, and if that causes a really sharp pain right there, that would typically be you know a positive test for that um, uh, this problem is day for veins, tenus and the yes. uh, So far, in any of the conditions. Uh, I haven't heard the use of ice or heat, Oh, but I, yes. I assume that you're doing one or the other or both. Or both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Frequently I'll use moist heat before I start a treatment. Mm -hmm. I do whatever it is I need to do, a little bit different for each person, and then I'll ice them when we're done. Absolutely. Very good question. Thank you. Any other questions?
middle of this bump and run through more of my slides. Yeah, well, okay. sure. Why don't you talk a little more about ice and heat because it's not clear which. Do I get to pick? No. Usually I will prepare somebody with a little bit of moist heat because it makes their tissue more extensible and depending on which overuse we're talking about, then I can get in there and work on it a little bit better. If I'm going to do uh, Graston instruments, then I may heat them first and then uh, use that combined with maybe some mobilization, depending on which thing it is, and ice I'll use afterwards. To so I shouldn't do either myself? Probably be advisable to have therapists this year. I'm a little easier. Oh. You can do it wrong. And you should try it to see which one, which one works better for you. Oh, no. My thought would be, if, uh, if I'm worried about pain primarily, I think ice is a good way to sort of vent the pain. If I'm interested in getting the tissues to be more pliable and flexible and healing and stretching out, then, then heat's going to be good. On the other hand, you're an individual person, and, and I like to tell people, you know, try it and see. We'll try, try it for ice and see what, see what ice feels like. Try some heat, see what that feels like. Maybe alternate. Maybe use that at different stages of, of your recovery. It's really individualized. But what feels better may not be the remedy. Yeah. Well, if it's so hot that you're making it swell, no, that's I mean, a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so and it just depends on sort of the phase. I, you know, a lot of times we use ice more in the acute phase, again, right. the pain control phase, and then switch to heat more in the healing phase of a problem. But um, um, it, I, we also, I, I don't necessarily want to tell somebody to do something that's going to cause pain either. So right. that's where I, I, I tend to be a little more flexible. <laughs> so let's talk about a little bit about cubital tunnels. We, we talked about carpal tunnel, which is the wrist, the carpus is the wrist. And you remember from the Bible, uh, you know, how many cubits did Noah make his ark? Well, they're talking about the space from the, the long finger to the elbow. And so the, the, the elbow is the, is the cubital area. And so cubital tunnel is compression of the ulnar nerve, a different nerve. It's at the medial aspect of the elbow. It's your funny bone. You've all smacked your funny bone, and you get that zap down your hand here to the small finger primarily, also this piece of this part of your ring finger. And that's the, that's the ulnar nerve, and it's a kind of an exposed spot right there where you really can bump it. Uh, now, some people will get a chronic compression, not just I bump it occasionally, but my hand is always going numb and tingling. It tends to be worse with uh, talking on the phone a lot. As you're worse if you uh, have your elbows resting on, on uh, uh, something like, uh, I did it. You know, I go, yeah, I felt like I'm, I'm like the poster child. Console of your car. <laughs> Console of my car. I drive my Suburban, and I put my hand right there, and my hand goes numb every single time. I have to move how I ride the, I don't know, apparently the Chevy engineers did not uh, have cubital tunnel syndrome, but I, I certainly get it when I drive that, you know, so I don't drive that vehicle very often. I, but um, so uh, I can be your armchair at home. I take my glasses off and go into bed. I'm read my book at night. So of course I gotta go like this, right? And uh, you know, then my hand starts to go numb because I'm flexing that elbow and putting that that nerve under a little bit of tension where it makes this corner, this sharp corner right here. And now that it's gonna put that that nerve under some pressure uh, pressure there. So here's just a, a little picture of it. So uh, that's the top of the arm and the forearm down below. You can see where that nerve is gonna pass through this this uh, cubital tunnel, and it's, there's about five different areas where that can be compressed. Um, you, uh, I didn't put the picture in that shows all the different five areas, but there's about five areas where this between the muscle bellies, where this underneath the, the what's called the fascia right there at that corner, uh, where there's distally between another couple muscles here in the forearm. And so if it comes to surgery, here's an example of a surgery picture, you have to make sure that all five of those areas uh, have, been, have been addressed. And, and then um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if it comes to surgery, you also have to make a decision. Do you keep the nerve in this little channel here, or do you move the nerve forward to kind of give it a shortcut? So instead of coming down to the tip of the elbow and back, I can give it a little shortcut, and again, to take some of that tension off the, off the nerve. And this pluses and minuses, and that's a, a, a detailed discussion we would, we would have. But, um, so the, the conservative, this man. What's the recovery time post-op on that surgery? For surgery like that, uh, it can be, again, a couple months of recovery because you've got to have initial healing of the, of the tissue and the scar, and then we need to work on mobilization, and this is where therapists, uh, therapy is really important to work on the mobilization, and then even some re-strengthening if we have to, you know, if our muscles have to be strengthened. you want to mm -hmm. talk about recovery? Um, sometimes I'll put them in a posterior half shell or a soft splint, depending on which surgery they did, if they had removed it or if they just released it. 
And it also becomes, again, on the person, how they recover and what kind of work they have to do. If they're going back to having manual labor, it's altogether a different game than if they're going to do the secretarial kind of stuff. So I would agree at least a couple months or more if it's having manual labor. So it's a, it's a fairly common problem. I get yes, sir. If, if you've got movement issues, like I can't straighten out this elbow. This one goes straight out and this one doesn't. And if I'm up here like this, like talking on the phone, I physically have to push the arm down. Is that this uh, same syndrome you're talking about? Because I, I also know. have the numbness. And it could be both. Fingers. Again, typically it doesn't necessarily block up your motion. Um, I mean, there can be other things that can that can block up the motion, but it certainly sounds you have the numbness, especially after you know in that position, then then that would certainly be at least a component of of uh, cubital tunnel or, or ulnar neuropathy. So to diagnose something like that, we would send you for nerve testing again, so you can you can test to see how does the nerve function um, uh, with some little electrodes and the speed of that nerve transmission. That's very important, and so we we would uh, do. Uh, nerve conduction that testing, either a neurologist or, or a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor does that kind of testing. Uh, and, then, and then we can address uh, you know, treatment options. It can be as simple as, again, some anti-inflammatories and activity modification, you know, changing what you do, changing maybe how you sleep at night to not curl up on your elbows and, and you know, changing where you rest your arms, uh, to therapy, uh, and even up to surgery. And so again, we, you know, with most of the things we try, we will try the easy things first. And most of the time, we make good progress. But if it's severe and it's progressive, then you may come to surgery. <clears throat> yes, is this what would cause your finger to turn white? Is that these two fingers turn white? It it can be, and that can also be um, uh, some other issues as well. More with the more with the uh, with the blood flow, uh, so not not directly uh, related uh, necessarily. But if that nerve was pinched, is that? What tells about to put the blood up there, or I don't know. Yeah, it, it can. There can be a, a couple of different things that can that can cause, um, uh, you know, the, the fingers kind of going white, and then you get kind of turn, you know, red, blue and red afterwards. And um, so that's that's um, you know, Raynaud's phenomenon or Raynaud's syndrome is more to do with the the art, artery that's involved. So. Do you, are you going to cover Raynaud? I am not. I was <coughs> planning on it, but. We can, we can maybe talk about it afterwards if you like. Yes, sir. Once your muscle starts to atrophy in your hand and you've got the numbness and stuff like that, that's time to transpose the nerve, I would think. That's what I had that done. Right. And, and again, it's definitely time to get the pressure off the nerve. And again, whether you do the, the just the decompression and or the transposition, the idea is to take the pressure off the nerve so it'll start to function normally. So you'll get that muscle signal to the muscle, the nerve signal to the muscle, so that you, you can maintain that strength. Uh, somebody with a, with a bad ulnar neuropathy can actually have quite a bit of weakness uh, in the hand and really lose quite a bit of function. So we can uh, move on to uh, another topic here, trigger finger. I don't know if anybody's experienced this before, where your a finger will get stuck down. That can be more than one, but a finger can be uh, locked down in, in a position like this. And uh, this is not, this, we want to contrast this to what we'll talk about in a minute called Dupuytren, which is a very gradual scarring of the finger that happens over time that can look like this. This is something that will happen abruptly. You'll feel a pop and now your finger's stuck and you have to pop it back. And sometimes it can be just a mild nuisance or even a, you know, a party trick to look at my finger stuck down. <laughs> but for some people it's a big deal. When their hand is stuck down and they can't use it now. And it's very painful. Or they'll wake up in the morning, you sleep at night, you might clench your fist. You wake up in the morning and your uh, finger is stuck down. And that can be uh, uncomfortable. And if you believe it, it can really lead to a loss of function. So why does this happen? So the, the tendons, I said before, the muscles are here in the forearm. They come up through the carpal canal, the, the tendons, and then the tendons spread out to the fingers. And right about here, the tendons enter into uh, a tendon sheet for each finger. And you can see um, there's a series of pulleys or, or sections of the tendon sheet that's very similar to the guides on your fishing pole. So you, you have to have that series of, of guides on your fishing pole so that the, the pole will arc down when you have catch your fish, right? And so if you didn't have that, well, you would just go from, it would just go from the reel to the tip, I guess, and it wouldn't be very effective. 
And that's what we need. We need that series of guides so the fingers will curl down in a nice organized fashion and not this bowstring straight across. The problem is that very first guide right here is in an area where the tendon can easily be irritated and start to swell up. And now it starts to catch on that first guide. We call it the A1 pulley. And if you can imagine a, a rope in a pulley that you might have in a barn, if you have a knot in your rope, it's not going to go through that pulley. It's going to get stuck. If it's a little knot, you can pull it through, but you're going to feel it every time. And, and if it's a big enough knot, you just not, that, it's just not going to work. And that's what happens here. You initially, you have the irritated tendon, it'll snap and pop a little bit, and as that swelling gets worse, it'll get stuck, and it can get, it can get stuck down. The, um, uh, let's talk about some therapy. Okay. So sometimes I've seen them before surgery, sometimes after. It can be pretty uncomfortable, especially if it's multiple digits. So then we may splint them to block that A1 pulley so that they're not hitting there, but still gliding their tendon in front of it and behind it. Sometimes I'll get just an injection and we'll keep working gently and that works pretty well. If it's a single digit, we can do something like this. You'll see a lot of different uh, gadgets that people say will cure it. It's not going to. <laughs> so then we'll progress them through therapy. If they need to have it fixed surgically, then we'll progress them through therapy afterwards. So it's, uh, you know, again, we will try the easy things first. One second. And, and, uh, Things like anti-inflammatories, activity modifications, some nighttime splinting. Uh, we'll also try an injection sometimes, a little steroid injection, try to reduce the inflammation around that tendon and, and uh, around that A1 pulley. If those things don't work, fortunately, it's a fairly easy fix, uh, an incision, and we go and we release that, uh, that A1 pulley, and then fairly quickly people get back to their activities and function. Yes, sir? Do we know what the etiology is? I, I've had it in multiple fingers, and it's gone away except for this one. Um, I don't use any traffic, really, but, <laughs> but, um, but it's the one where I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and it's down here. And, uh, I'm, I'm curious why it happens and then um, why it may have gone away in some other fingers but sort of persists. And as with most of our problems we're talking about tonight, it's usually multifactorial. So there may be several different reasons. It can be some genetics. It can be um, other associated diseases. For example, a diabetes can be associated with some of these disorders. It can be just bad luck, mm -hmm. and it can be overuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of a, probably definitely going to be an overuser. So it's, it's a kind of a variety of different things mm -hmm. that can that can cause it. Uh, there is an association with carpal tunnel uh, as well. They kind of go together to some mm -hmm. kind of common risk factors. Um, so it, it, I've had, um, and, and the, the reason you get it can also tell us a little bit about perhaps what might or might not work to fix it. If this is a problem that developed after a specific project, I had a patient that painted her fence. And so lots of gripping and painting her fence, and she developed a cute trigger finger. Uh, but then she's done painting her fence, we did an injection, and it got better. And we didn't have to do anything else after that. On the other hand, if this is something that's come on very gradually over years, maybe multiple fingers, and there's not one specific activity that you associate with what's causing this, our, you know, our chance of getting, getting this to resolve completely with one injection is really less, and then maybe we talk more about the surgical options. Yeah. So it can be a whole variety of, of causes. Sometimes what I'll do is look at tools that people use, and I can modify those with foams or splint material in the mm -hmm. clinic to give them a broader base, because if it's a, a really narrow tool that keeps hitting and they have to use it, it's going to continue to irritate that area. Yeah. So that's something to think about, too. Yeah, maybe a broader grip mm -hmm. on uh, mm -hmm. right. you know, like, like the, the tools with the big foam right. handle around it, so right. or padded gloves with another suggestion mm -hmm. on it. Are we going to talk about uh, another problem? There are no more questions. Uh, a gangling cyst, again, a very common hand and upper extremity problem. Uh, two people, the most common spot would be a bump here at the back of the wrist. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be raised up. Now, here's an example of one on the bowler wrist, sort of the second most common place I see it right here, kind of where you feel your radial pulse right there. Um, so it's a, it's a, it can be a visible bump. Sometimes it can be quite big, they can fluctuate in size. Uh, it can have, I've had little kids come in with these, I've had uh, adults and grandparents come in with the, with the ganglion system. So sometimes they happen due to a specific issue, like 
some underlying arthritis, and, the, and, and perhaps the, the wrist joints are producing some excess fluid because of arthritis, that can bubble up to form a, a pocket of fluid, or it's the, the tendons, the tendon sheath can produce some excess fluid. Or it can just be bad luck. It's hard to say in an eight-year-old that they're overusing their, their hands, so sometimes it just, it just happens. But it's the, it's the joint fluid or tendon sheath fluid that lubricates that tends to make this pocket um, here, you know, again, at the back of the wrist, at the roller wrist or the, this bottom of the wrist, or even sometimes in the, in the hand around some of the tendon sheath. Uh, I don't know if, there, if you ever see those problems, I don't know. If Not too often, usually it's either the front or the back of the wrist. It's not a dangerous problem. Sometimes it's a, people don't like the look of it. Sometimes it causes pain. If you have a big bump here and you bend your wrist back, well, that can certainly crowd the back of your wrist here and cause pain. And uh, again, conservative management. Uh, anybody remember what your grandma told you to do? Hit it with the Bible bumps. Hit it with the Bible, right. <laughs> so uh, sometimes people will try that, and I don't discourage that. If they want to give it a try, I don't tell them to do that because they hit it too hard. But that certainly can work. And essentially, just rupturing this pocket and spreading that fluid out. It does cause a little pain uh, until, that, until that resolves itself. So, and that may be it. That may be all you need to do. Uh, if that doesn't work, we can certainly try to aspirate the fluid out with a fairly thick fluid, and you have to really um, you know, put a pretty big needle in there to pull it out. The, the challenge I have with that is the pocket is still there. So that pocket will tend to fill up. So aspiration tends to be a temporary fix. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's really a nuisance, we can certainly make, a, make a, a fairly succinct incision and take it out. And most of the time, that will resolve it. Now, unfortunately, the source of the fluid is still there. That's going to be, again, the tendon sheath or the joint. And so it can come back. And so I mean, once in a while, the patient has to come back for a second or even a third surgery if that if that cyst will come back most of the time you know years later any questions about about the ganglion cyst can you get it in your elbow you can that might be something slightly different that we'll cover in a minute that's probably electron on bursitis yeah bursitis bursitis so we'll, we'll look at that in just a, a minute um we uh we talked about nacre veins let's see if i can get it. uh here's another uh, common hand problem called a dupatrens contracture and again, here's that finger cocked down, but this is something that's happened very slowly over time. And what, what happens is you develop a band of scar tissue that very gradually can pull the finger down, uh, one or two fingers, the most common being the, the small finger or the ring finger. Uh, on this example, uh, we've got sort of two different levels of severity. You know, the, the one finger's bent all the way down, and it's stuck. You can't bend that back. It's just, it's stuck. It's fixed down that position. And the other one's kind of about the joint, but you can see that band uh, coming, you know, from the from the palm at this level down uh, to the finger. It's a, it gradually progresses over time. Uh, sometimes you'll initially see some sort of thickened callus areas or some dimples in the skin. That can that can often be early dupatrens. So what is this? This is a a uh, a contracture or a scarring of the layer uh, in the palm called the fascia. And this is the layer that makes the palm of your hand a useful layer to work with. Try doing some work with the back of your hand, you would just tear it all up, it's too soft and, and not a sturdy layer. The fascia is what makes this uh, a nice working surface, and that fascia will start to gradually contract. Um, it, there's often a genetic component, it's more common in people of northern European uh, descent. Um, and so, um, we might sometimes we'll ask about you know what your your heritage if you come in with this. Uh, you might see it in in a family. You might have well yeah my dad had that or my uncle has that. So uh, it can certainly be attributed to some of your hand activities, your work activities can aggravate it or a prior in, you know uh, uh, injury or wound. And sometimes it can just be bad luck. You can get the same problem uh, other parts of your body as well, like in your uh, uh, in your feet for example. Uh, but we'll cover stick with the hands today. The, um, you have any, maybe we can talk about maybe early therapy and then late therapy, uh, before and after. Sometimes, though, rarely it will help to splint because it'll prevent it from getting tighter. Usually they end up having surgery, though. Surgery now is not the huge open the cash procedure anymore. I'll see, like, dry needling or diet gel so people can move easily, and I'll see them, uh, very few visits, and they're quite functional. We'll make them a splint. To wear for maybe six weeks or so, and if they're not losing motion, then they're fine. Otherwise, we'll continue to have them wear and work on the scar and scar sensitivity. Things. So it's um, it's again sort of looking at the at the different stages in severity. And sometimes it happens very gradually over time. It's not a big emergency, but 
You don't want to be like the guy that came in living in Alaska for 10 years with both hands tucked in like this and he couldn't use his hand. Well, how long has this been going on? Well, 10 years. And he just didn't come in. And if you come in like this, and now you've taken a fairly straightforward problem at stage one or two, it made it a very severe problem where we may not be able to get that back. That, that, that joint is so contracted that no matter how much, how big a surgery you do, it's just simply not going to come all the way out straight. Um, and so uh, that's one where if we recognize it, we'll follow it along, but if it's worsening and progressive, then we really need to get fixed. And, and essentially the, the sort of the uh, traditional surgical approach has been a great big zigzag incision all the way up the hand where you can look at every single piece of that of that scarred in uh, cord and essentially cut it out. Um, now we can, uh, especially we catched a little bit earlier, we can do a little more limited incision and still uh, take out the, the cord or sometimes we can just release the cord even through a percutaneous approach where we can just feel it and release it and, and, and straighten it out. Um, uh, you mentioned Zyaflex which is a new medicine that actually will dissolve the cord. Um, the, um, and, and, and some of the hand centers have had really good luck with that. I haven't pushed that too hard because, at least up to this point, the single injection of that has a price tag of about $3,000, and uh, insurances have not been really good about covering it. So I've kind of been a little hesitant to say, well, you know, would you, would you like to spend this much money on an, on an injection? That may or may not work, that you might have to try a couple of times before you really get it to, to work. So, um, but that is an option, and that, that um, it's a it's an enzyme that will actually dissolve that scar tissue itself and then you come in a day or two later and, and just kind of snap it, pop it, straighter. Um, it can come back. Again, any scar tissue or any surgery done for scar tissue is going to result in more scar tissue and so that scar tissue can start to contract in it over time. Um, you might say, well that doesn't biologically, why does that happen? That doesn't seem like a good idea. But if you, if you can imagine a scar, let's say you have a wound um, and you need that to heal up. There are actually con contractile elements in that scar tissue that will help you shrink the size of that wound over time. So having scar tissue that contracts is actually a very useful thing for the, for the body. In this case though, it's kind of scar tissue gone wild and, and this is then it causes a problem. So the, the, the ability to, to have scar tissue that contracts is really a, um, a benefit most of the time. Okay, we covered our, our uh, um, tennis elbow. We had a question about elbow bursitis or olecranon bursitis. So uh, the tip of the elbow, that's the, the ulna bone, it's also called the olecranon. And uh, it's an area where we have several of these areas in the body where you need to have some extra tissue to allow you to flex. Okay, and you can all feel that, and you can shrink your elbow and pick up that little bit of extra skin there and kind of wiggle it around. And the same thing at the front of the knee. You've got some extra skin right here. And, and, by, and when you bend the knee, you need that to, to slide. You need the, the skin to be able to slide back and forth across the tip of your elbow when you, when you flex it. So places where your body needs to have tissue sliding, you're going to have a bursa. A bursa is loose tissue that typically even have, a, you know, sometimes a little bit of fluid to allow um, some sliding. Now, what happens when that goes wrong? That's an area that can very easily swell up and, um, and, and quite dramatically form a big pocket of fluid. So bursitis or inflammation in that bursa sac, now it fills up with this big pocket of fluid and, uh, and then can be unsightly, painful, um, it can make you sick if it's, if it's infectious bursitis um, uh, or just you know, cause a lot of pain. So again, this is a you know, fairly common problem, again, maybe in our older patients. It can be associated with um, pressure over the elbow or a specific injury or a fall. Um, it sometimes can be associated with um, a big bone spur. In this, in this example, there is a big bone spur. Again, we, we call that a traction spur. It's where the tricep muscle attaches to that bone and with constant use, it can irritate uh, uh, and, and, and cause a little bone spur to form or traction spur, and then that can cause uh, this inflamed bursa sac. So, um, from my perspective in, in treatment, uh, again, if it's, if it's non-infectious, it's just sort of a 
you know, a, a gradual onset. We can certainly try an aspiration with the needle. We can try activity modification in terms of avoiding pressure uh, over, the, uh, uh, over that area, anti-inflammatories. Um, if we do pull the fluid out, we'll typically put a little ACE wrap or a compressive bandage on there to try to get it to, to sort of scar back down again. But occasionally we get to the point where we need to do surgery and actually go in and take out the bursa sac. Um, and again, you know, with the compressive dressing. Um, and, and if we see a big bone spur like that, we'll take out that bone spur uh, as well. Uh, your perspective. Uh, sometimes I will use what's called a demo sleeve. It's got a little bit of compression on it for comfort for patients. I'm usually seeing that for something else when that occurs, either an accident or something else. And it can be very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. So we'll compress them, leave that on, have them take it off for range of motion. And usually, fortunately, it usually will go back down. Very rarely have people had to go to surgery, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we certainly try the Certainly try the easy fixes first. Yes. How successful are you in removing the bone spur? Is, is, it, is it a really difficult thing uh, when you're elderly to get back after you've removed it? Does it come back? The bone spur is, is typically fairly easy to remove. Um, it's uh, when we're, we're in there surgically, we just uh, we have a little thing that kind of bites it off, or a little chisel, we can chisel it off, and then we try to smooth it out. We actually use a rasp, and be very similar to what you might have in the workshop at home, a rasp to smooth the bone out. Uh, associated with that, there may be a little tear of that triceps tendon where, where it was attaching to that bone spur or deeper, and we'll put a couple of stitches down. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, depending on how big that, that tear in the triceps is, that may extend the recovery a bit because then we have to be careful not to overuse and then even go to therapy to work on range of motion and then um, and then even strengthening once we get through the range of motion. Absolutely. Any other questions about that? How are we doing on our time? That is a lot. Mm -hmm. Lots of time for questions because that's kind of an overview of the uh, of, of these kind of common uh, upper extremity problems that I had. I have a, a, a series of pamphlets kind of on our back uh, counter here. The uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has a website that has a lot of really good information for patients on all the different things that orthopedic surgeons take care of. Uh, and it's, it's meant to be uh, usable for our patients. So you, you go uh, to uh, it's orthoinfo.org. I have it on the, on the brochures there on the internet and you can then it'll bring up a little outline of a body and then you can click on the different body parts and then it'll bring up a list of, uh, of uh, complaints or diagnoses and so I try to print out the ones that we talked about tonight they're typically one two three or four page brochure that will have some diagrams and description of the problem and treatment options so please feel free to take however many you want. How about arthritis? Okay. In hand. Is there treatment for that too? Or? Yes, there is, and it depends on where the arthritis uh, is located, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it can be tricky. So the small knuckles, the small joints in the, are very common places to get arthritis, and those can be tricky. They've, they've tried uh, different types of joint replacements, similar to we have you know, hip and knee replacements we do all the time. Those are very successful procedures. But these are small joints, and, and the, the anatomy is tricky and having enough space to work with. They've tried some little plastic um, uh, artificial joints, for example, and what we found is that those haven't held up really well. So typically, we'll try our conservative measures first, the, again, the anti-inflammatories, uh, Tylenol. We'll try uh, activity modification. Again, maybe tools that are, are easier to grip, so thicker tools or a padded glove. Um, I'm not sure. Do you have any specific recommendations on arthritis? That's exactly accurate. It does. And lots of times with splints, if a joint's really, really painful or really inflamed, we'll work with that. We'll instruct patients on joint protection, energy conservation strategies for approaching daily tasks, how to break it down, how to pace yourself. So there's really a lot we can do. Change the way you do things will help. Not stress the joint that's so irritated. So, sure. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's Voltaren gel, so it's an anti-inflammatory, a topical anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And that, and again, when I say anti-inflammatories, 
Um, I'm making a very general recommendation, and you have to know your health history or come in to see somebody because anti-inflammatories are not appropriate for everybody. So if you have a history of kidney disease or liver disease, um, you know, or, or uh, uh, stomach upset or GERD, you know, gastroesophageal reflex or uh, heartburn, um, if you have those kind of problems, you know, anti-inflammatories may not be for. If you're on a blood thinner, anti-inflammatories systemically might not be a good idea. So. Um, they're inexpensive, they're over the counter, but you can run into big problems. So, um, the topical anti inflammatory, which, you're, which you mentioned, to me, may be a good solution for some of these things because now you're applying it directly to where the, the issue is, is, where your issue is at, and, and hopefully have more of a localized effect. Um, the, the medicines were initially uh, uh, FDA approved for use at the knee, um, but you can certainly use them other, other places. And again, that's a, a, a good idea to try something like that. They tend to be a little bit more expensive because they're not available generic, um, and so uh, it does tend to be more expensive depending on your insurance. On the other hand, it's less expensive than a big surgery, and, and certainly safer than maybe taking a bunch of pills. The insurance doesn't like it, they don't pay it. They don't like it, correct, because it's new and it's not, it's not inexpensive. Um, we have had some luck at the Halls, for example, a uh, pharmacy here in town, of getting them to, to make up their own sort of blend of, uh, of a topical anti-inflammatory uh, for less expensive. So it's not a scam, you can put something on your skin and it'll help underneath? It can. Mm -hmm. Remember the MSO, they used to be a common thing people would use for uh, um, like a topical? So one of the one of the formulations actually had a DMSO in it, apparently, it's supposed to really help the medicine uh, absorb through the skin and have more of a localized effect. So, so does it go in the skin and then in your bloodstream and then all over? Or just right, it just soaks right through me right there where it hurts? I I like to believe that it soaks right there and has a localized effect. <laughs> okay. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is going to be some systemic uh, absorption, absolutely. Um, so the the uh, you typically they'll apply it to where it hurts, whether it's the knee, whether it's the hand. You know, you're applying it there with the effect of uh, with the hope that it's going to have the effect right there. Um, yeah, I just know, thought that was man man. It can be, and actually the, the placebo effect can be very effective for, for, for some of these things, but again, it's, uh, uh, you know, sometimes patients really don't have any other options. You know, if, they, if they're on an anticoagulation for a history of blood loss or atrial fibrillation, you, can't, you just can't give them systemic anti-inflammatory, so we'll try that. Guys. Amazing. Yeah, well, I come in here a couple of weeks ago, and well, I've been hungry late, mm -hmm. these pants. Mm -hmm. And I wake up in the morning, six o'clock, I can get close. Man, it's just killing me. Mm -hmm. And they scheduled me for a nerve test. And I'm still waiting on that nerve test. Evidently, there must be a lot of people over there waiting. Yes, and that's something we don't have control over the nerve testing. Um, the nerve testing can either be done by the neurology office or at physical medicine or rehabilitation. They're both. Uh, you know, different providers, but they provide a really excellent nerve test. But it's a very detailed test. You'll see when you when you do it, it's a very meticulous test with uh, with multiple tests and data that they collect, and it just takes a long time. So they they're unfortunate that can be uh, you know the cause of a, of a, a few weeks delay uh, to get that. On the other hand, if we're talking about a, a serious problem, we want to know how bad is it, or do we have the correct diagnosis? Because there can be more than one thing that can cause numbness and tingling in the hand. Perhaps it's a problem at the neck, and you know, you could, I can do carpal tunnel surgery all day long on somebody, but if it's a neck problem, mm -hmm. I'm not going to fix them. I have to know, is it here, or is it at the neck, is it somewhere else? So that's, well, that's really helpful. Yeah, well, that's what I, but I got another doctor with you, what's going on with my brother, Ketch, and he told me, he said, Glenn, he said, it probably is in your neck, he said, because you think of where you can turn and it pops and everything. That may help some of the But I'll tell you right now, this is really killing me. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope we can, hope we can get I'll it figured out pretty soon. I hope so. Because it's really bad. Step in. Um, on TV, I heard an advertisement probably for a medication or something about um, a connection between arthritis and is it eczema or psoriasis. Okay. It, does that have anything to do with, like, and arthritis, or? Probably not as much. I mean, you're talking about psoriatic um, arthritis, or psoriasis is the, is the condition. Uh, people tend to have uh, really scaly, they call them plaques, 
uh, typically on the elbows and knees, for example. Right. So there's a systemic inflammation problem. So it's a rheumatologic disorder with a systemic inflammation, and they tend to have bad arthritis in, for example, the hips and the knees, uh, particularly. So if you can address the systemic inflammation with the medicine they're advertising, you may be able to uh, you know, reduce that, that arthritis or the, or the risk of the progression of the arthritis. How do you determine with testing between carpal tunnel and tendonitis? Well, you look at the you look at the symptoms, and again, uh, uh, tendonitis all by itself shouldn't cause numbness and tingling, for example. And so that might be a, a good way to look at it. So uh, a nerve problem will usually have numbness and tingling, or perhaps, as we saw in the picture, the loss of some muscle mass. Um, uh, or the type of pain that you're experiencing versus the tendonitis, which will typically be more of a swelling and, um, and pain. The, the nerve tests, again, that's where that can really help us out because, again, you're, then you're specifically testing the nerve function, and that should be able to help us clarify between the two. And I tell you, there's a lot of overlap between these symptoms, and, and sometimes there's more than one problem um, that, that we have to address. And how about arthritis in between all that? Absolutely. And again, um, <laughs> you bet. So, so for example, here you can have arthritis at the base of the thumb. Mm -hmm. You can have that big veins, and you can have carpal tunnel all at once. And it's all right here at, on this side of your hand, and, and it's, it can be it can be tricky. Again, that's where we order tests. That's where we try one treatment, try another treatment, and, and try to sort it out uh, to get you feeling better. So where where would you start? You know, what, what do I, would I start with you or start, you know, when you got like multiple, you hit like three different things. And I can poke exactly where it hurts in multiple spots, mm -hmm. but I've had neck problems and I've had shoulder surgeries and, and it, you can't sleep at night type of thing. So where do, you, where do I start? Well, I would start with your primary care provider. And, and again, the primary care provider is usually good at the initial assessment and try to guide you in the right direction. And then you have to pick the worst problem and start to work on it. So that may be a referral to a, a specialist, like a, one of the one of our partners here in our office. And then we would try to, to say, okay, what's the biggest problem? Let's maybe order some tests like that nerve test uh, or x-rays or, or an imaging study to try to figure out one, one or two of these problems and sort them out. And then we may say, you need to go to the therapist. And the therapist can hone in on one or two problems and they may they may take a broader approach and look at a number of different problems again I, we kind of talked about we both are going to take a look at it in terms of diagnosis and evaluation physical exam um, and so that's where you know by the time you've seen a couple different providers hopefully we'll have figured out the correct diagnosis and you know try to go along yeah, I honestly never have I don't have a family doctor or anything like that I don't do sick stuff but to, for that, I didn't know if I just call it down here and say, you know, I need to come in. I don't know how to describe it to you, but I need a doctor. Yeah, and you certainly can. I mean, we, we certainly can start from ground zero here. Depends on your insurance. If then some insurance is required that. I'll just put a little advertisement out there for primary care. Primary care provider is a, is a good thing to have. You don't have to go to them all the time, but they can certainly guide you along the way in terms of general health and testing and, and uh, uh, things. So... Um, if you don't have a primary care provider, that might be a good place to start as well in terms of just sort of establishing with somebody and developing that relationship and rapport. Yes? So brain odds is not similar to any of the carbon tunnels or cubicle tunnels? Or... No, it, that, and I'm not a very good expert at, at the brain odds. So it, it's, it's not a, it can be associated with some of these other diagnoses. It, but it, it, not every person that has carpal tunnel will also have the brain odds. Um, that can be an entirely different problem. It can be associated with some of the rheumatology uh, diagnoses. Um, so that it, 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 it can be a, a variety of things. It can be um, it can be related to the temperature and the weather. It can be completely unrelated. I mean, some people who have a bad will just have the fingers go white and, and um, just even on a sunny day, you know, or, you know, it's not just a, a cold weather phenomenon. So that's a, that's a lot more, can be a lot more complicated problem. What is a rheumatologist? A rheumatologist is somebody who specializes in inflammatory conditions. So rheumatoid arthritis, we talk about psoriatic arthritis. Um, there's a, a whole series of inflammatory conditions 
and that's what a rheumatologist specializes in, is, um, is sorting out the different uh, diagnoses, and uh, there's a lot of specialized lab testing involved, and then a lot of specialized um, medications. Really, really strong medications um, that, that, again, uh, that, that type of a specialist can, can manage best. So, you know, you think of, of a person who treats cancer, they're using uh, really strong medications to treat cancer. Well, some of those same types of medications are actually used in rheumatology as well. And those are, are uh, that's why it's a special, it's a specialty uh, uh, position. What would be in play? Uh, it can be any number of things. You can have the uh, muscles and tendons, the joints can be inflamed. You can have some of them are actually inflammation involving the uh, arteries themselves. So. Yes, sir. Have you seen any correlation between, say, tennis elbow and trigger finger? Uh, do, do those tend to run together or maybe unrelated entirely? Or? Well, um, the, uh, not, there's not a specific correlation that I'm aware of uh, in terms of you know, not like the diet, not like the carpal tunnel and the trigger finger association. That's a, that's a stronger you know, correlation. <clears throat> but um, uh, again, they can both be overuse problems. And again, depending on what, what your overuse activity is, that, that, that can be the, the relating factor. Yes, yes sir. Um, you discussed some of these diagnoses as being overuse, some of them being more positional and some being genetic. Um, at what point do I consider um, having to seek medical care because of, of what's happening? Well, that's a good question. I, I think it's when, when it's bothering you and affecting your daily activities. When you have uh, symptoms on a daily basis, uh, when the symptoms are progressive, when they keep you from doing what you enjoy doing or want to do or need to do, um, and it's typically when you've tried some of the over-the-counter remedies. Maybe you've tried some ibuprofen and Tylenol. Maybe you've tried resting it, and it's not getting better. Then we should, we should probably uh, uh, take a look. If it's something like a significant neurologic change, then that's something that you may really want to think about. If it's, my hands go numb and tingly once in a while, you can deal with that. You can work around it for a while. But if there's dense numbness um, and it persists, you shouldn't wait around um, and you should see somebody about that. Um, that's one of the things, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to have carpal tunnel, maybe for years, but some, for some reason you'll sort of turn the corner and now your hands are numb every single day, you need to do something about that. Yes? Have you noticed in your practice any increase in hand issues with the activity or not? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I haven't really noticed uh, specifically my you know, the, uh, texting. I, I guess I haven't really noticed that uh, uh, specifically. Well, I had one person say, we were talking about, he had a tendon laceration. He said, I need to be able to use my thumb. He said, he needs to be able to flip open his phone and he needs to be able to you know, dial it. You know, but uh, otherwise, I haven't really noticed anything specific on that. Can carpal tunnel come back if you've had surgery on it once? Yes, yes yeah. it can. And typically, it's something that can come back over a number of years. And again, the, the transverse carpal ligament that reforms, uh, it's some scar tissue, it typically reforms sort of in a widened position, but over time it certainly can come back. And depending on your activities, there's certain activities that, that may still uh, cause, um, uh, cause trouble. And in fact, a lot of these conditions can come back. Um, depending on, on your activity level and what you're trying to do. 